had songs, as you said, recorded everywhere from Notorious B.I.G. to Celine Dion to Ricky Martin and all kinds of genres and styles in between. I work with Steve Perry and Journey. That's a weird one on a charity project. Um, I've had songs in lots of movies, Top Gun, Karate Kid, Coming to America. I was on the uh, staff of the TV show Fame for five years when it was in syndication, working with Debbie Allen and during the Janet Jackson uh, period and, and Carrie Hamilton, Carol yeah. Burnett's daughter. That was a, a cool time. Um, and of course, when we get into the other part of my life, and in internationally, I've, you know, I've recorded in every language. I've had cuts in every language known to man, Coco Lee and Mandarin Chinese, all the way to Russian and every other language. And the other big thing about me, of course, is my whole international work. I'm from Chicago. I came up in the 60s, and my father, who is kind of an unsung hero to me, he's kind of one of the heroes of my life, was involved in the whole civil rights movement in the 60s. So I grew up as a little orange-haired, carrot-top kid, only working around gospel music and R&B music. The Chess um, family, Chess Records, Phil and Leonard Chess, that was family friends. So when I was a little child, I was at Sessions for Etta James and Muddy Waters because they were family friends. And the reason that matters is because even though obviously I'm, you know, whatever I would be, I grew up with R&B and soul and gospel music as an organic quality in my childhood, which meant that later on musically I became an R&B writer, which was kind of funny because after my childhood I became involved in theater and I, I, I was an actor. I actually went to school to be an actor. Musical theater, I was on Broadway early on in one of the early revivals of Hair for a minute. I did national tours, I did bus and trucks, I was in summer stock. I led the life of a musical theater actor for 10 or 15 years. I went to school in New York. Nathan Lane was one of my audition buddies. I'd always been interested in music and songwriting and, and music, but then I followed the uh, acting thing. So what happened is I reached a day where I just went cold turkey, an epiphany day in 1976, where I just said, I'm not happy doing this mm -hmm. musical theater life, auditioning for Godspell and Jesus Christ Superstar and going up for dog food commercials. And I had an agent and I was leading the life of being an actor in New York and I just wasn't happy. And I just reached a moment where I just said, I can't do this anymore, I'm really not comfortable auditioning and being in the limelight and more of a behind the scenes kind of person actually. And when I reached that epiphany, literally from that moment to having my first hit was only nine months. I decided to concentrate on songwriting, which was my other passion and love. And I made that decision and I'm saying, you know, in today's world, nine months doesn't seem like that's a big deal because people go on American Idol and in six weeks they're, they're 10 weeks they win and they're a star. But from our world, being a songwriter back in the day, nine months was pretty quick to go from making a decision to be a full-time songwriter, having nothing happening, to being with a hit. What I did is I basically led 19 years of life in nine months. I was in 18 bands. I was living in New York. I was performing in Central Park on the weekends, busking with a band of mine called Rendezvous. I, we were discovered by a guy named Neil Levinson who wrote Walk Away Renee. I know Neil Levinson. You know Neil? <laughs> From New York. Yes. He what? saw me singing in Central Park and wanted to do some demos with us. And then a guy named Tony Camillo, who was Gladys Knight's producer from Somerville, New Jersey, discovered me in the park with the male trio. I did some demo deals with Warner Chapel, Frank Military, all that. And then what happened was, the break was, the old thing, my mother said, I know one, aha, I know one person in the music business. And she had almost married, she was engaged to be married to a guy named George Sheck. George Sheck was the manager for Bobby Darren and Connie Francis back in the day, all those kind of acts. His son was the, the O.J. Simpson's lawyer, Barry Sheck. Yeah. It's his father. Yeah. Anyway, she said, I know this one guy in the music business, and he basically took me under his wing. Uh, Laura Brannigan was the receptionist. And the other thing that happened was I had an, my agent from acting said, I know one person in the music business as well, and that was a music publisher named Susan McCusker at Love Zager, where I met Alan, right. Rich. Uh, Rich. And that was a production company in the 70s, and they had Whitney Houston's mother, Sissy Houston, and the Spinners, and Ronnie Dyson, and Denise Williams. And I basically started, started writing there for free, and within a very quick amount of time, I was able to 
rise up through the ranks being uh, that it was very easy for me because R&B was a natural thing for me. This was an R&B production company. My manager was able to coerce the first single for the spinners, but it was called The Body Language. It was a Fantastic. disco hit, 1979. Music Bridges is my high-level cultural exchange project. I was bringing songwriters to politically sensitive places to intentionally show through writing songs together we could create. So I started the Soviet Union where I had Cindy Lauper, Diane Warren, Lieber and Stoller, Michael Bolton, Desmond Child, Wendy Waldman, and we went to the Soviet Union in 1988 and we wrote songs with them in a retreat fashion and I've done the same thing in Cuba. I brought 125 people to Cuba and that's the dictators I've known. We had a private reception with Fidel Castro and it has nothing to do with his politics, just the idea that a regular little songwriter guy was able to have it be that 125 people were having private uh, reception with Fidel Castro. To a translator, he patted me on the back and said, the world needs more creative visionaries like you, comrade. Well, but I had Bonnie Raitt and many, Woody Harrelson and Gladys Knight and Mick Fleetwood and all these people. So I was very well known for doing these projects all over the world. In the beginning, I, I, I was also writing. We put the names in the hat and they're drawn by random selection. I always would say, leave your ego at the door and let God decide who needs to write rather than being assigned or any of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the first thing that gets drawn to the hat is Cindy Lauper, a Russian gentleman named Igor Nikolaev, Frankie Previtt, who wrote uh, I've Got the Time of My Life, and me. And so Cindy Lauper goes, and I'll, as long as I live, it's 30 years later and I still get chills, hairs. She goes, you mean I gotta write with the organizer? <laughs> in front of everybody. I'm sitting here, it's my project, but we ended up writing a great song. I love her. We got to do the record. She flew me to New York. She treated me royally. The point is, is that, that that went from utter terror to a more than happy ending. My father was involved in using gospel music through his work in the community in Chicago with the black, all that. He believed that music was a way that brought the communities together, the white and the black communities through music. And that instilled in me the idea that you need to make a difference with your life and have a purpose. And that's been my purpose. In fact, everything I've done has really been kind of walking in his footsteps in my spiritual mind. The idea was as I became a professional songwriter, I was invited to all these music festivals. I was going straight from a screening of Lethal Weapon 6. You know, we need a song for Lethal Weapon 6. And there I'm there with, you know, Desmond and all the writers. We need songs. I'd get on an airplane and I would be in Kazakhstan for a week at a festival, getting to be friends with people from Cuba, Kazakhstan. And it was this disconnect between our world of making a living as a songwriter in Hollywood. And then I would be going to the world where it would all just be about music as a tool to bring us together. And I decided, what if we could bridge the two worlds? The world of bringing people that have everything and understand what it's like to make a living in music and bring them to places with people who don't in politically sensitive situations and bridge all that together. And that led to a lot of, there's, you know, there's retreats all over the world now in songwriting camp. I didn't do it to make money. I mean, I, it wasn't what it was about. It was an extension of my songwriting artistry. I call it the art of organizing. That's what I call that. Yeah. I call it another kind of art. I want to see every country on earth. I'm up to 112. I added Nicaragua two months ago, and believe it or not, I'm going to Spain and Portugal in the fall for songwriting camps. I've never been there. It'll make 114. Anyway, um, what I'm working on is a whole bunch more Music Bridges products, of course. I just scored a f I'm scoring a film now called Ooh. Fake News, believe it or not. <laughs> <Believe> it. <laughs> it's written by my friend. It's an indie film. It actually has real actors in it, Eric Roberts, Julia Roberts' brother, yeah. and John Savage from The Deer Hunter. So sure. it's like a high-level independent. I've had a lot of songs in films, right. but I haven't been a film score. So this is right. a new experience for me. I had a couple hits last year in South Africa, and I went there, and I, that's an amazing country and I'm going back there in the fall and I have a publishing deal and I'm doing all kinds of Man, work boy. there. We're at the Songwriting School of Los Angeles, ladies and gentlemen. I've been teaching here for five years. I teach online at Songy.com. I taught at Music Institute. I do lots and lots of coaching, teaching workshops all around the world. So I believe that I have some reasonable sense of these things. The big thing we had, besides the money and, and the fact that we had records and all that, was the community. We had a community. And 
it's being forged now again, which is beautiful, and I'm happy about that Sona quack <laughs> and other things. Right. Challenges are, obviously, how do we monetize our career? Obviously, it was a different world because it was a private little world. Once you were inside, there were gatekeepers, which there no longer really are. Once you were in the club, we all made a living. Now you have to be completely self-contained. They have to learn how to not only be great songwriters and everything else they have to learn, they have to be social media savvy. Obviously, here we are. Social media savvy, they have to learn how to market, they have to understand the business side of things. I had a manager, I had a publisher, I had a mommy, I had a daddy. All I had to do was go write my little songs, you know, you smile, because we were all there. We got paid, we got demo budgets, let's go write a song today, Judd! Yeah. And it's all different. different, but it doesn't mean it's worse. It's just different. Change is the only thing we can count on. Yes. And of course, we either adapt or we don't. Two weeks ago, I was in a room with six people writing a song where there were five top liners and a producer, and we all took turns in the mic, and then we decided to composite a vocal made out of five different people's top line melodies. That's a big change creatively from, from where we come from. Yes. The piece of advice I would give is that Everything that we're going through of like, oh my God, it's so different from the way it was 20 years ago. 20 years from now, every young writer will be us then saying the same thing about wherever we are. And the other most important thing to me is even more so now than ever, you have to do it because you love it. If you really, and, and another thing that really matters to me is you have to want to be good. You can't just do it because it's a way to make some money or it's a way to get some things going. You have to do it to, to be good. There's a lot of things to learn and all that, but if you just lead with doing the best you can, being open to trying every opportunity that's given to you and not allow the things you don't know to stop you or crush you, if you are meant to do this and you stay with it, something will happen. creating community for songwriters, giving us back empowerment and awareness, and also for not the outside the songwriters, your public, the people that will find Quack, yep. the people who will be interested in, in us or what we do. We're nowhere without them, obviously, and hopefully you would say they're nowhere without us. It's, we hope we, we agree that we all need each other in one big happy, Music community world. of music world where music matters to everyone, right?